In today's case, I will talk about the bizarre disappearance of a 10-year-old boy in Spain in the 1980s. In decades since, numerous theories have circulated as to the circumstances of his disappearance. To this day, no clue as to the whereabouts of Juan Gomez has ever been found. Andreas Martinez was a truck driver who in 1986 lived in Murcia, a small town in southern Spain. He was married to Carmen Gomez and they had a 10-year-old son named Juan Pedro Martinez Gomez. Juan was a good kid. He was attentive in class and achieved good grades. An only child, he was adored by his parents. They had a strong bond and Juan greatly respected his mother and father. On June 25th, 1986, Andreas had a delivery to make in Bilbao, in the far north of Spain. The family would travel together. They would refuel the truck in Cartagena, in the south. Their cargo was to be the dangerous liquid chemical, sulfuric acid. At 7pm on the 24th, Andreas, Carmen and Juan arrived in Cartagena to refuel and then headed north, stopping at the city of Cuenca to sleep. They woke up early and continued their journey, stopping again in Madrid at 5.30am to have breakfast. They continued on their journey and at 6am in Somosierra they were involved in an accident. Andreas was driving fast, approximately 140 kilometers per hour. The truck's mirror collided with the mirror of another truck, which was traveling in the opposite direction. This caused him to turn the steering wheel violently, lose control, and to collide head-on with an oncoming car. The impact caused both vehicles to leave the road. Andreas's load, 20,000 litres of sulfuric acid, ended up spilling onto the road, and most critically, over a nearby family cabin. To really get a sense of how dangerous this all was, let's take a quick look at sulfuric acid and what it can do. Sulfuric acid is a colourless, odourless liquid. It is extremely corrosive due to its high acidity and it is highly flammable. It not only causes chemical burns to the skin, but also thermal burns due to the effects of extreme dehydration. It is so corrosive that it can react with both metal and stone. Its effects are immediate. The civil guard rushed to the scene of the accident. Their first action was to evacuate the local population as quickly as possible. After the civilians and injured people were removed, the guards focused their efforts on neutralising the thousands of litres of acid before it contaminated the Duraton River, just a few metres away. The team wore oxygen masks during this process. Sand and lime were poured over the affected area, and after three hours of hard work, the guards were able to breathe without masks and properly assess the damage. As the dust settled, police officers began the painful task of identifying the victims. In the truck, they found bodies with broken limbs with broken glass strewn everywhere. There was a significant amount of blood. It was a sad, tragic scene indeed. Furthermore, parts of the bodies were partially dissolved by the acid. Some of Carmen's identity documents were still intact, and when searching the National Register for family members, just shortly before noon, they found her mother's phone number, Mrs. Maria Legaz. The police officer explained that Carmen Gomez and her husband Andreas Gomez were involved in a road traffic accident that morning, and that unfortunately, they did not survive. Maria, desperate and in shock, asked about her grandson Juan, but the officer said there was no third person in the vehicle. Maria said that this was impossible. Juan was with them. Her daughter told her one day before that the three were going away. Juan was only ten years old. He wouldn't have been left at home alone. Upon learning this information, the team ran to check the truck's cabin. They found children's clothing and cassette tapes, an indication that a child had been in the cabin at some point, 
but there was no sign of Juan himself. Throughout the afternoon, more people arrived, and in the following days, a helicopter and sniffer dogs were used for the search. But mysteriously, Juan had just disappeared. Investigations into the accident were also ongoing. The hypothesis was raised that the brakes were faulty, but an expert ruled out this possibility after verifying that the braking mechanism had not suffered any defect even after the accident. It was also verified that the tachograph, an instrument that records time, speed and distance, it showed that up until the accident, the vehicle had made 12 brief stops on the road, each lasting from 1 to 20 seconds. Other truck drivers reported that there are no reasons for stops like this. They need to meet deadlines, and stops are very much restricted to just meals and rest. Stopping 12 times during a delivery for a few seconds on a road where there are no traffic lights was very strange. The search continued for two weeks, until they ended without finding the boy. Because of this, several theories began to emerge. The first theory says that he had survived the accident after being thrown through the windshield. Considering the truck's design, Juan was probably sitting between his parents. He should not have been there, as there would have been no seatbelt available for him to wear. His parents had been found wearing their seatbelts. In this theory, when Juan was thrown from the vehicle, he may have gone to the river close to the accident to clean up the broken glass, then fell into the fast-flowing water and was carried away. But this is a strange theory. If a ten-year-old child survived a car accident, he would more likely remain at the scene, in despair, not knowing what to do and would not leave to clean up. The second theory is that Juan was completely dissolved in the acid, but scientists said this would be impossible. Even if the liquid had been completely poured over him, some remains like bones or teeth would remain. They added that sulfuric acid does not make a human body disappear in a few hours. This process would take weeks. A third theory says that he might have survived and that a passerby picked him up in order to take him to the hospital. But on the way, the child died and the person or people panicked. Afraid of being judged, they decided to hide his body. A fourth theory suggests human trafficking, a topic which has already been considered in other episodes here on the channel, such as the disappearance of Lars Mittank, the disappearance of the Dutch women in Panama, and also the air rescue of the teenager who was travelling on the Alaska Airlines. In this theory, these people who found Juan as a survivor did not intend to help him, but rather to traffic him. A fifth theory says that he was not in the truck when the accident happened due to the fact that Andrea's stops were to deliver drugs, an extra job he was doing. While at the gas station having breakfast, the family may have been pressured into making an extra delivery, but they refused. As a way of forcing them, Juan was held by these people until they delivered the drugs. This could have caused Andreas to freak out, causing him to lose control of the truck and causing the accident. This theory of drug trafficking was reinforced in 1987, when a newspaper published an article about the accident saying that there were several concentrations of heroin in and around the area. If this theory is true, we will never know what happened to the boy. To this day, Juan's disappearance is spoken of throughout Spain. Just talk about the boy from Somosierra, and many people will have an opinion. If he is alive, Juan would be around 45 years old today but unfortunately his whereabouts are still unknown. If you've made it this far, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to this channel. Also, add your opinion in our comments. Thank you very much. I will see you in the next case.